so excited to share this word with you. Isn't it fantastic that we're going to be able to give out some 350 awesome school backpacks? That's just so awesome because of your generosity, and, and it's just so neat. Could really use, you could actually also go to the, our website and say, I, I'll help pack the backpacks or give them out or whatever. We could use a lot of help, but it's just going to be super neat. I, again, if you see, if you want to follow in the sermon, we're, we're starting this sermon series, I Love My Church. Can I tell you, I love my church. <laughs> and uh, God has made my life so rich through, through all of you. And in my whole life, I can't tell you how thankful I am to have been raised in church. I'm so thankful that my kids, I call it, they got to be on Noah's Ark. They didn't have to go in the world, in the flood of the toxic world. They had friends that were in the church. They met their spouses in the church. They lived another kind of life uh, because of the church. And, and, and i just so thankful for that. But part of the whole message of this series is not just that I love my church, but that Jesus loves his church. <laughs> I mean, he shed his blood for the church. He calls the church his bride. You know, a lot of people are are kind of negative towards the church these days. And who needs church? And, and they'll, they'll say, oh, the church is hypocrites. And they've got all of these things. Sometimes I want to just kind of jokingly say, you know, you, you kind of ought to be careful when you criticize somebody's wife. I tell people, you can call me ugly as long as you want. But you better watch out talking to Sharon that way. I might have to lay hands on you suddenly. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's my bride. She's my girl. But you know, there's a reason we love the church. Not because it's perfect. It is so flawed. But because of Jesus' beautiful plan for it. And we're going to go in the next few weeks in the book of Ephesians and look how all he says that he's laid out for a blueprint for the church to be a habitation of his presence. To be an army that changes the spiritual climate of a community that showcases Jesus in a dark world that that heals. And today, since we've been talking in July about freedom, I thought this message just really transcends beautifully. One of the reasons Jesus loves his church is because the church provides a place for people to heal and find freedom. We say it all the time. We are not a country club for saints. We are a hospital for sinners. Perf imperfect people are perfectly welcome. In fact, if you're perfect, maybe you don't want to come here, all right? <laughs> You intimidate us a little bit. But, but, but the idea is we come, not because we're something great, but because we have an amazing Savior. And when we come to his family, he not only through the gospel touches our heart through his word, but he reaches us through people. God, in a, in a supernatural way, has planned that his church family would be vessels or aqueducts of, of his life to one another, that we would be connected like a body, that his blood would flow through the members of this church, that we would literally be able to love each other to life in Christ. Look at this verse in Ephesians 4, 14 to 16. I'm reading from the message translation, Ephesians 4. No prolonged infancies among us, please. In other words, 75-year-old babies are a problem, okay? Don't prolong that. We'll not tolerate babes in the woods, small children who are easy prey for predators. God wants us to grow up. Somebody say grow up. <laughs> to know the whole truth and tell it in love. We're going to learn about that. How do we grow up? We tell the truth in love. Like Christ in everything, we take our lead from Christ who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in his love. That literally through the fellowship of the saints, that, that his life comes into us. I, I described the main idea today. Connections are key to life resurrections. <laughs> when we get God's connections, we begin to experience resurrection. There is something about connecting. I just tell this story. It was kind of interesting. About 2014, I kept having this problem with my voice. I started to sound like the Godfather, you know, something like that. 
And, and I went to the doctor. They couldn't find it. They said, well, you just, you know, you have acid reflux, whatever. And it kept getting worse and worse. I run into this friend, doesn't live in this city, but from high school. And he, he says, there's something wrong. And I know a doctor in Dallas. She's, she's my friend. Gives me this card. Has me go. Immediately she finds this cyst in my larynx. And, you know, thank God they were able to just pull that out. It wasn't cancer. We celebrated that. And, and I was healed. But I began to think, what if I didn't have that connection? <laughs> What if I hadn't had that friend? Can I tell you, God has so many things he's going to do in your life through people. Yes. And, and you're not only going to be called to a blessing. God has not only spiritual blessing. He has spiritual friends. He has, like I call it, a pack that has your back. He has a life team for you. He has people that will connect with you. And they will become some of the greatest gifts in your life. How many have friends that you would say, these are some of the greatest treasures I have in my life today? And that's what the church is for. It's great when we come together like this in worship. We have inhabit, God inhabits our praises. But he wants us to then go beyond that into connections, into small groups, into relationships that will bring life to us. A, a great book that, that I came across by Dr. Johan Hari called Lost Connections. He also did a powerful TED Talk. And, and I thought it was just really interesting because he was commenting on society. And we all know that there's this incredible epidemic, mental health, depression, anxiety, and so forth. And he, he begins to describe in that book how throughout history, thousands of years, people always lived in tribes. They had their groups. That's how they overcame predators. That's how they built their houses. That's how they did life. They always did life as an us. In modern society, that began to change. We began to move and we began, you know, even families are, are living all over the place. We began to disconnect as tribes, as people. And then, I mean, you put on top of that a pandemic. Oh, my goodness. And all of a sudden, connections have been broken like they never have before. And, and, and then people begin to fill the gap with what some call pseudo-community, you know. Fake, I mean, Facebook. I mean, just let's have social media. I won't really let you into my life, but I'll let you see my page, <laughs> You know, and, and, and I got my best, best picture. Get this side. This side makes me look skinnier. Wow, you know. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you that my, about my perfect kids, and I'll tell you about my perfect world. And, and you know what? At the end of the day, we're isolated. Uh, our friendships have deteriorated. And, and what doctor, uh, this doctor realized was, that the more we're isolated, the more we're introspective, the more we withdraw into ourselves, the darker our hearts become. The more depressed we become. The, the more we don't even understand it. But it's, it's not that this is wrong or that is wrong. It's that we're disconnected in ways that God made us to connect. This one, he talks about a Dr. Ever, Everington. And he's a psychiatrist, and he noticed he couldn't give people enough meds. <laughs> and, and so he said, i got to get some other prescriptions here. And again, we're not speaking against medication. Thank God God uses meds. But he said, these people, they don't just need medication. They don't just need medication. They need social prescriptions, not just medical prescriptions. What they need is a connection. He, he began to do this test, and one of the things he had was a kind of a, 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 some vacant property behind his building, so he decided to create a community garden, and he invited all of his depressed and anxious patients, and he said, would you be a part of experiment? And they had to get extra meds to say yes, but anyhow, <laughs> they got there, and they were just like a mess, and he says, no, here's what we're doing. We are just going to connect by creating something beautiful on the earth. Will you come every day and build this garden? And they just, started, they just started becoming a community. The results were unbelievable. One of them said, the more that the garden started to bloom, the more we bloomed. 
The moment we created something beautiful together, something beautiful happened in us. Now what I want us to hear today is that's what God created the church for. People to come from whatever isolation and say, come together and make something beautiful called the kingdom of God on earth. Come and, and, and bring hope. Come in the middle of this world and reveal an alternative life. A life that can only be lived by the gospel. People accepting each other, not based on creed or race or, or political views or, or personalities, but based on Jesus. How many know we're all the same at the cross? <laughs> Sinners saved by grace. There's a place we can come together. doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you know. We all come the same place by the blood of Jesus. And we come into this fellowship as, as loved people, forgiven by grace. And we're able to accept others because we've been forgiven and accepted. And in that, God begins to grow communities. And if we let him, as we're going to study next week, we become these communities like in the book of Acts, that changed the world. And so here, here's what I want to say. Here's God's plan. I know we wish that we could be free all by ourselves. I know it's a lot easier. God, I don't really like opening up to people. How many would say I'm kind of a private person? Come on, God, couldn't you just me and Jesus? I want to be free. I just don't want to tell anybody my stuff, you know. Just me and Jesus. Uh, he says, I'm sorry. Doesn't ha not how it works. This is a body. This is a family. Somebody said, you didn't get sick by yourself, and you can't get well by yourself. People got you messed up, and people got to fix you up. Both, both happen. It's the same thing. You have to find community. When you find connection, you find resurrection. You find that connection in God, and then life begins to come. You begin to experience grace. God not only releases this grace vertically, he releases grace horizontally through the relationships that we build. There's a couple of things I put here. Freedom is not just having right beliefs intact. It's having right friends who have your back. It's not just right beliefs. It's right relationships. God calls us out of isolation, out of being prisoners of despair. And he chooses us to plant us in a place where we can grow, where we can be healed. I love this verse, if we, we, if we could have it. It's in, uh, there in Psalms, what is it? Psalm 92, 13. Psalm 92, 13, if we could, we could show that. For those who are transplanted to the Lord's own house, they flourish in the courts of our God. I just love that. God says, when I plant someone in the house, they begin to flourish. I love this verse uh, as well, where he talks about the fact that in Psalm 68, if we could look at that verse, Psalm 68, 6, this verse, I love it as well. God sets the lonely in family. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. Some people say, well, I've got loneliness, and you could put the word depression in there. You could put the word uh, regret. You could put the word uh, low self-esteem. You could put the word anxiety there. God says, I have a prescription for that. I got a kingdom family for you. Now, you, you have some family, great. Some of you are blessed with awesome, natural families. I'm so glad. But no matter if you're alone in this town or, or if your family's so broken, there's a family God can create for you. It's a kingdom family. And it's not just coming to church. It's, it's, there's going to be three, five, ten, twelve people. And God will, will stick you together. And when he plants you there, when you're planted there, he sets you in a family. And when he sets you in the family, the prisoners become set free. Freedom begins to come. As you've never known it. Joy. Life comes into your heart. 
What I put here, in community, God multiplies our strength and accelerates our healing. You know, there is, there is what's called individual strength, but then there's relational strength. There's two kinds of strength. We have to understand it. There's the kind of strength, well, I'm strong. Okay, good. But can I tell you, you're not strong enough. I, I'm determined, yeah, but your determination's not big enough. How many know one is always too small of a number for greatness? Look at, look at what Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12 says. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better. For a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Can I tell you, the best you is more than you. I have a friend who said, some of the best thoughts I ever had were thought by others. <laughs> how, how many know you're not smart enough to think all the thoughts you need to think? You need to borrow some thoughts, sister. You need, you need the wisdom of other people in your life. There, there, are, there are these battles we face in our head. And, and we talked about it in these last four weeks. The battle to get out of our own head. I mean, some of us know what it's like to get stuck in your head in that spiraling way of negative thinking like a funnel of water going down a drain. You start a day, the next thing you know, one thought comes and then another and I hate my life and I'm not going anywhere and life is hopeless and, and we keep trying. We're saying, don't think that way, Dale. Come on, what's wrong with you? And thank God, it is so important, as we've been teaching, that you tell yourself the truth, that you speak the truth. But I found out that sometimes me speaking the truth to myself isn't strong enough to break that cycle. I need someone to echo the truth back to me. Have you noticed that, that group think is more powerful than I think? When I think by myself, I'm, I'm sort of, but when, when I'm with a group that thinks, I tend to think stronger for good or for bad. That's why peer pressure is so big. But when I'm with people that echo back to me who I am, what I can become. And every time I say, you know, I just don't think I've got the goods to really make this business work. And they say, no, you are who God says you are. Come on, girl. You, you know you can do this. Suddenly, those thoughts. Can I tell you, raising children, whatever you do in your family, create the echo. Boy, I'm telling you. Find what you want to tell your kids every day and tell I, I To this day, I live with the echo of powerful words my mom told me, my dad told me, my pastor told me. There's something, you know, my mind towards myself tends to minimize my value, <laughs> tends to be the worst, my worst enemy, Right? I mean, you know, 10 people can say, you did a good job here. And one person can say, man, you're a jerk. And I forget the 20 people that said I was good. <laughs> and I just become bound in those negative cycles of thinking. But what I've learned when other people, like, it's so funny. I knew I was a leader. But when Miss Hasty in sixth grade says, Dale, you're a leader, I suddenly believed it. I felt that I was called to minister to people, but when I met this girl named Sharon, my fiance, she says, Dale, you've got a gift to lead people to the presence. I said, I do? Yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> now, why didn't I just believe myself? I don't know. But what I know, if you get enough people echoing back to you who you are, it will form your identity, and it will change who you are. We need the help of people to break out of patterns and cycles. Can you relate to this? You say, I know what I want to be. I know what I want to do, but I don't do what I want to do. <laughs> I don't say what I want to say. And, and, and determination is not enough. But I'm telling you, if you plug into a group of people who do that, 
they'll take you on their boat with you. They'll, they'll empower you. I don't know why I thought of this movie. Remember that old movie, Sister Act, Whoopi Goldberg and the nuns? You remember that? And Dolores, the nun, she's in this kind of witness protection program. And, and uh, you know, the gangster's trying to kill her, so they put her in this convent with all these nuns. And uh, it's a great movie. But my favorite part is because she's around these nuns, she gets a new script in her life. Uh, even when the gangsters try to get her, they can't get her back. I just love that because I said, when they came to get her, all these you know, nuns were surrounding her in this casino, and they just couldn't get her because she had another pack. And she was never going to be a nun in herself, but all of a sudden, she was becoming nun-like in every way. People help you be your real you. If you plug in, I, I tell you, I, I have this quote in, in your notes I thought was really good by this fellow Kevin Eckenberry. He says, look carefully at the closest associations in your life, for that is the direction you are headed. Can I just tell you, tell me who the top five voices are in your life. Just write them down. These are the voices that I hear in my life the most. Guess what? They're telling you your future. And, and I just urge you. Proverbs uh, 13, 20 says, walk with the wise and you will become wise. But the companions of fool will suffer great harm. You know, if you get these right voices, you get your life team together. I'm telling you, the whole direction of your life. I can tell you, as a young man, when I was about to go off the wagon, I remember I literally headed towards the door one, one weekend night. I was going to do the wrong thing. I was mad. I was messed up. I got to the door, and these three brothers in Christ were there. Where are you going? I'm not telling you where I'm going. Dale, get back in the house. <laughs> and, and, and all of a sudden, they were just giving me, hey, remember who you are, dude. Remember, Jesus is in you. Yeah, but I want to take care of, no, no, remember who you are. And all of a sudden, the pattern of a life I would have gone right back to. Can I tell you, if you want to be a good husband, find three good husbands. And tell me, tell, say, tell me husband, wife. <laughs> three great wives. Tell me, find a parent. Don't just read books. Books are great. But they don't change you that much. People change people by their influence, by their fellowship. You're going to be different when you leave today. I guarantee you, just because you've been in the fellowship today. <laughs> you, are, you are more alive than you were an hour and a half ago. A huge part of this is choosing your friends wisely. And, and let me just say this. The Bible makes it clear what a life team is. There's, there's these three characteristics. People who share Christ's values, people who love you unconditionally, and people who tell you the truth. This is who you are. Number one, they, they're, they're, they're following Jesus. Don't be unequally yoked. They're following Jesus. And they accept you the way you are. They love you on your good days they love you when you're a brat. They love you when you're nice. They love you when you're ornery. They love you. But they speak the truth in love to you. They say, friend, I love you too much. We are going to live in the light together. The way you just treated your kids, that's not okay, bro. Come on. No, that's not who you are. This, this lighthouse, it's just like a plant the more the plant is in the light, the more it grows. The more you put it in an attic without the light and the truth and the environment, the more it withers, the more it dies. Can I tell you, great relationships don't happen on accident. They take intentionality. <laughs> they take a decision. Especially you come to a new church somewhere, it doesn't just happen. I mean, as they say, if you want a friend, be a friend. You start serving people. You start finding someone to encourage 
You, you, you step out. You take, you take efforts, and God will lead you to your people. I tell you what. He says in 1 Corinthians 12, 18, the Lord will set you in the body where he wants you. Well, where do I fit? I know where you fit. Trust me. He says again, you will be planted. I will plant you. If you seek and say, God, I want my friend. I want my pack. Who do you call? Who, who's my life team? And you say, God, I'll step out. He will put you. He puts the lonely in families. When you get those five, six, ten people, it'll change your life. Now, that's going to mean sometimes you have to disconnect with some people. Can I tell you? Sometimes the first step towards connection is disconnection. <laughs> Jesus said sometimes you're going to have to leave people that you've been doing life with, even family. But whoever does, for my sake, they're going to get a hundred more friends and family. Sometimes there are people in your life that, that you've been holding on to. God says, I have new relationships, but you're not, until you leave these, you're stuck here. But once you get free here, I'm going to have it for you over here. But you say, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to make it work. I'm going to make it work. Why are you, why are you just holding on? And yet, you know that it's unhealthy. You know that it's causing you. And the Bible teaches very carefully. There are boundaries. And one of the things that free people do, I like what Gandhi said, I won't let people with dirty feet walk through my mind, you know. Whether the, you know, that's the internet, that's wherever. I won't let people, I won't be a person who allows the, the, the wrongs and the toxics of others to begin to just steal my life. I, 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 will, I will find a way to break those, those relationships that are about. Now, sometimes... You can't just leave them. Uh, some of you might be married to them. We, that's another story. Anyhow. <laughs> but you can redefine them. The, redefine those relationships. We're not doing relationship that way anymore. I'm a woman of God. I'm a man of God. I'm living for the Lord. I love you. How many know some people you love up close? Some people you love from afar. You say, I love you. I love you. I love you. But here's my fence. I love you. <laughs> love you a lot. Does that make sense to you? Yes. And we've got to help each other because if we don't get our pack, we won't fulfill our dream, our calling. And finally, let me just say, it has so much to do with learning to be honest and vulnerable. This is the hard part of community. The easy part of community is just being together, singing. The hard part of community is just being vulnerable. Being honest with what's going on in our heart. How many know we like to wear masks? We like to pretend. We like to role play. We like to deny. How are you doing, brother? Great! I, I tell people all the time, do you really want to be free or you just want people to think you're free? You got the free kind of, you know, spiritual language. But do you really want to be free? Do you really... Want to allow yourself to be transparent enough and open enough so that other people could, could have a positive and powerful influence. Do you really want to take off that mask? I heard a funny story. I always liked it. it was This guy had a hard time getting a job, and so they, they needed a gorilla at the zoo. So he said, I don't know about this. He says, could I somehow, I'll get a costume and... And, and could I get that job? They said, okay, sir. And he loved it, man. He dressed that gorilla suit, beat his chest. Everybody came to his cage. Woo, 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 woo. He'd swing from the tree. Wow. You know, he had the ape life down perfect. But one day, he kind of accidentally swung over the fence into the lion's cage. <laughs> and he was laying there in the lion's cage. And the big old lion came right on him and started breathing in his face. And he said, help, 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 get me out of here. I'm not a gorilla. The lion said, shut up, dude, or we're both going to lose our jobs, you know. <laughs> See, I'm trying to say, take off your mask and get out of your cage. Get out of your cave. Get out of your isolation. Get real and get healed in Jesus' name. Look at this verse in James 5.13. 
Very powerful verse, James 5, 13 through 20. Are you hurting? Pray. Do you feel great? Sing. Are you sick? Call the church leaders together to pray and anoint you with oil in the name of the master. Believing prayer will heal you. And Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you've sinned, you'll be forgiven, healed inside and out. Well, I don't want to call anybody. But that's what he says. Look at this. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. The prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. Elijah, for instance, human just like us, prayed hard that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't. Not a drop for three and a half years. Then he prayed that it would rain, and it did. The showers came, and everything started growing again. My dear friends, if you know people who have wandered off from God's truth, don't write them off. Go after them. Get them back, and you will have rescued precious lives from destruction and prevented an epidemic of wandering away from God. I, I want you to see this interesting verse. Confess your sins to one another. Open. I don't want to do that. You see, a lot of these masks, I say, are, are layers of lies we've believed. Well, I'm just a private person. My mom said, we do not hang out our dirty laundry. I know mom said it, but God didn't say that, okay? Well, well, I just, I just don't want to bother people. I, I just, you know, I'll take care of it. I got it. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good, you know. Well, what would people think? They think I'm this. You know what, what they would think? They would say, thank God he finally knows his issues. Woo! But anyhow... God, I can't, I can't reveal that. I can't, I can't be honest about that. I can't bother people with that. But he says, this is so powerful. He says, confess your sins to each other to, so that you can be healed. Notice he doesn't say so that you can be forgiven. You're forgiven when you confess your sins to God. Yes. But you're healed. See, how many have ever been forgiven by God, but you didn't feel healed? You still were prisoner of the regret. Someone said, when you confess your sins to God, the, the skeleton comes out of the closet. But when you confess to others, we take that skeleton and bury it in the deepest sea and it's gone forever, you know. When you, when you come to the light, and again, there's times and ways to do this and not to do this. But what I want you to see is the bigger picture. When you're willing to move from a secret life to an open, honest life before God and a community of trusted friends. God says you're going to be healed. There's something about it. Jesus would even say, whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Why is that? Well, it's not that you forgive their sins, but when you speak forgiveness, they hear that voice. It gives them faith to receive the forgiveness God says is theirs. I'll never forget a lady in this very house. I looked at her. She, I could tell she was a tortured lady. She was, she was so sad. She came a few weeks. I noticed she was carrying this box. Finally, she came up and talked to me afterwards. And I just said, please, can, can we pray? I said, can you tell me what that is? She said, well, this is an urn. And I've got my daughter's ashes in this thing. I said, would you mind just sharing the story? She said, man, my, my daughter and I had this horribly difficult relationship. One day, we were fighting. I was telling her, and I lost my temper, and it was ugly, and it was bad. And she took off out of the house, drove away, and got in a car accident and died. And she said, I could never forgive myself for that. I remember over the next few weeks, we, we prayed. She prayed with some of the ladies. We helped her. And the day came, someone was speaking to her. Did you know that Jesus forgives? The blood of Jesus. Did you know? 
I mean, she knew it in her head. But when they spoke to her, something deeper came into her spirit. I'll never forget that, that funeral, that cemetery. And as she laid those ashes to rest, Jesus had healed her. She was restored because she was willing to share and be in the light and just bring the truth. There was a day, I'll never forget it, St. Clement's uh, Episcopal Church, a little prayer chapel, and I had become a Christian, but I thought when I became a Christian, I wouldn't have any of those old desires anymore. And I was having a terrible time. And I, and I invited these friends, would you go to this church and pray? We're in there. And, and finally, one of them just said, come on, share what's in your heart, Dale. And I was so afraid. And I'll never forget, as I just kind of, you know, just started telling them about everything I was struggling with. I thought they were going to go, oh, my God, Dale, you are a disaster, you know. They said, me too, me too. That's the very thing I'm going through. Really? By the end of that moment, that time, God had healed my mind. God brought joy again to my life. He brought grace. There are layers of things that have kept us from people that have kept us from God. Freedom is coming to the light and letting those things, one layer at a time, be taken off of your life. Let me just end with this. I want to make the most urgent appeal. God is appealing to people who are disconnected. Connection is the secret to your resurrection. God wants you to connect in spirit and in truth with the church. I said it earlier. It's like Noah's Ark. I just love that picture. We need a safe place. We need a place in this crazy world for us, for our kids. We need a connection. And we need to help others. Did you notice when I read in James, it says, if you know someone who's wandered off, don't write them off. Go after them. Can I just tell you the burden of a pastor some of the sheep are wandered off. They're hurting. Let's go after them. It, it, may, it may be prayer. They may not want to see you. Let's go find them, though, and say, we still love you. We still believe in you. I don't know what's happened, but it doesn't matter. We're your family. Come on, let's come back. Come on, let's connect. Come on, be restored, be healed, be reconciled. God has a plan.